Um, so uh, for our next presentation, um, we'll have here John McLoon, who is the Director of Technical Communication and Strategy at Wolfram Research Europe. Um, and he will talk about data how data science is more than just statistics. Thank you. So I'm uh, very mindful that it's half past four on a Friday afternoon, and you've had a long and uh, and probably intellectually demanding day. So I promise I'm going to keep this fairly light, and I thought I'd share a few kind of um, more um, conceptual points just to focus your mind on your own pro uh, problems and how to address them rather than any uh, deep technical detail. And to try and keep it interesting, I'm going to throw in a bit of uh, live stuff, and we'll see how that goes, uh, some live experiments and uh, a bit of, maybe a little bit of live coding. Um, so... The thing that motivated this was a uh, number of times as I go around doing uh, uh, projects for different organizations, I keep hearing in different words the, the theme that uh, organizations have gone to big data and they've spent lots of effort thinking about the macho stuff, the infrastructure and the storage and the CPU power and uh, clusters of computers, and they've got rid of their statisticians and hired a bunch of more expensive data scientists and then found that they're doing statistics just like they were before when they had small data. And often, even when I look at it, I, I feel like it's, more, it's even worse than that. Very often, it's just counting, that you have all this data, and what you're doing is you've measured x billions of times, and then you count how many times x meets some condition. And it's all about slicing through the data, but not about gaining insight. And so that's what motivated this idea that I should perhaps try and address some of the things that, in the mindset, that changes us away from thinking about the two being equivalent uh, um, topics, or at least on the on the kind of um, what you do with the data in the end of the process. So here's my subtly different claim for what data science is, which is computation with data. Now, this is um, driven by uh, my background of doing all kinds of computation for years, because my view of computation is that statistics is one small facet of computation. Computation has been developed in lots of different disciplines over many years, particularly in the recent years as, uh, as computers have uh, accelerated it. But every different discipline has developed its own collection of computations. And when you put that superset together, along with statistics, there are all kinds of different ways of thinking about data, that you can approach it from a modeling point of view, you can think about pictures, you can do more modern things like machine learning, but then there's all kinds of special ontologies like geometry and uh, image processing and signal processing and queuing theory and all of these different areas of computation, and they all apply to data. So if you don't listen to the rest of the talk, my thesis is broaden your mindset to the full set of computation that one could apply. So what does computation give us? Let's go through a few kind of, uh, and I'll apologize now, they're all very toy examples. Um, we charge lots of money for our consulting, but the first two uh, were free of charges, so I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, and they're mostly five small examples just kind of try and illustrate the point. So one thing it gives us is more things to do statistics on. So we can continue to use the tools we had, but have, but computation allows us to extract more knowledge to compute on. So here's the, the first project I did uh, that I didn't get paid for. This is uh, my daughter came to me and said uh, she was writing about Lord of the Flies and she wanted to study uh, the thing in a slightly more computational way and said, uh, how often do the characters get mentioned? So we went through and we, uh, we worked out that the beast gets mentioned very briefly when it's discovered, but only becomes a big deal in the middle of the book at the, at the point at which the bad guy, uh, Ralph, starts, uh, sorry, Jack, starts uh, rising to power using the beast and then we see Ralph return at the end to try and regain power. Just a counting exercise, and we knocked out that in, uh, in, in a few minutes of just counting the number of times the words Jack, Ralph, Beast appeared throughout the book. Uh, but then I said to her, well, wouldn't it be useful if we looked at the story that's going on rather than simply the occurrence of the characters? So we've, we've thought about uh, what if we measured it by the sentiment of the sentences? So we can take a text sentiment analyzer, analyzer and run through the sentences, and here I'm just asking it to say in real time here, it's just calculated which is the sentence of the book that seems most likely to be a positive sentiment. We're going to have fun on this island, sounds pretty positive, they don't in the end. I don't know if you all know the book, but it goes rather badly for them. Um, so what we did was we said, okay, let's count the sentiment, and we threw that onto the plot, and if, I guess actually I need to uh, recreate this plot, which I forgot, so that's the code to make the first plot. The counting was actually the hard bit, and now we're going to throw over the top at the running sentiment throughout the book. And uh, once it's done this, you can see that everything is jolly fun at the beginning. Lots of positive sentences early on when they're exploring the island, they discover the beast. Things become a bit more neutral. And then as the bad guy takes power, things go rather negative. Things improve around the time that the good guy t turns up, and then it all has a horrible ending. 
And we can pick that out because we can start thinking about counting meanings in the words rather than just counting the raw data itself. Right, here's an example from a completely different context. Uh, another completely non-paying customer. This one's my wife. Uh, she's a scientist and she's uh, working on needless injection devices, shooting dr powdered drug into the skin. So this is, this is a proxy for the skin. This is uh, outside. And then these are the drug particles that have been shot like a shotgun down into the skin. They're very small, but she has to worry about getting deep enough, not having too many, so it bruises the skin. And so she wanted to count these things. And uh, when I found out what she was doing, she was holding rulers up to the screen of the computer. So there's a whole ontology of, um, of image processing, and there's a whole language and spurks that go over computation. So I looked at this and thought, well, the blobs are easy to count when they're like this, but when they overlap, they're a bit harder. So we, uh, I looked at the data, and I thought, well, what we can do is we can clean this up, of course. The first step of image processing is filter the thing, and then we can measure the edge from the distance, and you end up with this sort of distance filter, and then you can see that at the points where you, there's any concavity, you can start picking out the local maxima. And now we've got something to count. And so if I do that now, here's the code to run through that. I'm going to throw a little cross on each of the identified blobs. And you can see it's done a reasonable job on these overlaps. And now we can count them and say, well, what's the histogram of the densities of the data? And so if I rotate it the way the skin is, that's the orientation. And you can see that uh, most of the particles have uh, reached a similar kind of depth. But there's a kind of profile where the sides of the blast zone, I don't think she described it as a blast zone, but uh, you get more density and less in the middle. So it's a kind of disk of, of contact. OK, another thing is um, we want to reject context. That raw data on its, on its own is not uh, terribly useful stuff. We want to be able to join it to things that make it give meaning. So I try to think of a, a, the simplest example to add some context um, that seemed relevant today. So I went and I got the London uh, Transport for London accident database, scraped that down. So here's the database of all uh, accidents in London over the last five years. It's about one year out of date. So it's 2010 to 2015. Uh, and of course, it's, you know, if you are going to try and look up a particular case because you're in court or whatever, then it's a useful reference. But it's the context that gives it meaning. So trying to make it personal to us, I said, let's look at the street outside here and look at the uh, density of, uh, of, of uh, accidents so that now we know as you leave here uh, today, after I've worn you out with this talk, turn left rather than right if you want to be safe. <laughs> so here's the venue if I've got the uh, geolocation right. Uh, but it's the map that makes that uh, meaningful to you. The data itself is un uninterpretable. Um, and there's obviously lots of ways you can look at this. We can look at the individual accidents that are on the log file, and you see actually they're all minor. There's, there's no red ones on here. I did a, this talk somewhere else, and it was surrounded by red dots on the crossroads, and it was a bit less of a tasteful example then. <laughs> oh, if anyone's interested, this is the whole of London. So avoid Westminster is the worst general area. Um, this is the, the densest area of accidents in London. But if you narrow it down to about a 50-yard distance, then it's the Elephant and Castle roundabout down here is the one to avoid. So don't drive there. We'll try and cross the road at the, at the roundabout. Can you normalize that by pedestrian density? Um, so, so actually, I skipped it here because it's kind of a bit meaningless. But I was, uh, I was still playing around with the example. And I was pulling in. I was interested to know whether bus stops were dangerous. So this is the database of bus stops. I wanted to inject that context. And I looked at the... Um, distribution of distances from a bus stop and distances uh, uh, from an accident. So if you were parachuted in at random into London, this is the two distributions. And you can see that uh, the um, accidents happen much more closely to the, um, to the bus stops than away. But then I realized, of course, I'm uh, measuring completely the wrong thing because that's not a causality. Bus stops are on busy roads. Accidents happen on busy roads. That's what I'm measuring is the busyness of the roads as a proxy. So I ran out of time thinking I'm going to normalize the traffic on the road by trying to measure the differences along the roads that have bus stops on, which is really the, the true computation. Um, but that's, that's the danger of updating talks at the last minute. I ran out of time. OK, here's a different one, a project I did for um, looking at some real data for an outside organization, uh, which is um, data on a supersonic car that I was given. So they gave me uh, 30 channels measured from this uh, supersonic uh, vehicle. This is the, um, the RPM of the front right wheel, so a proxy for speed. It's actually not absolutely speed because the thing starts sliding through the mud at, uh, at 600 miles an hour. And this is the uh, displacement of the suspension. Uh, and there are going to be lots of other channels which I, I walk through. But what I want to show here is that by just some trivial computation, we can change our viewpoint. And of course, when you've got multidimensional data, you have hundreds of viewpoints to choose from that uh, we, we naturally fall into the way we look at things, so things get plotted against time very often. But if you plot it against some other thing or some computed value, you can completely change the orientation that you look at hyperdimensional data. 
I didn't do that here. I thought, let's throw some calculus at it. So here's the velocity. If you find the acceleration from that, then it starts becoming more interesting. And you start seeing these uh, little steps of acceleration, and then this easing off, and then this massive negative step, which really only makes sense when you inject the context of the accelerator pedal setting. And you can see now that actually the driver or pilot, whatever you call them, has put this accelerator up in steps to see how the car would react. It's reached top speed, and this, I think, is air resistance gradually building up until eventually he takes his foot off the accelerator and it slams into reverse, effectively, um, as the air resistance is so high at that point. Uh, but by doing things like transformations like basic calculus, you can start uh, viewing the same data in a completely different context. And then did the one I thought was rather mundane, but uh, it was the one that knocked the engineer off the chair. I looked at the other data, and I transformed that into another viewpoint. Uh, I thought, let's do something called a, um, a, a continuous wavelet transform on it. And what this gives us is the frequencies at up and down and time across the bottom. So there's lots of low frequencies early on. And then you get this interesting event here where you get some massive growth in the low frequency, but a spike in the high frequencies and another event here and then another event going on here. And being a data scientist, when he said, do you know what that is? I said, I don't know, it's just numbers to me. Um, but he said, this is the front uh, top of the wheel going supersonic. So this is it breaking the sound barrier and it's causing this sudden massive spike in high vibrations. And then as it exits the sound barrier, you get the same effect. And I think this is the parachute deploying at the end, which is shaking the whole vehicle up. Okay, next meta point. So, um, slightly regret this example, because the last talk, if you were in here, was essentially all about this. <laughs> um, uh, trying to find ways of injecting completely new viewpoints, just thinking about things differently. And one of the, one of the things that I, I find most fun in data science is when you can take a concept from somewhere else that has nothing to do with the topic you're looking at and find a new home for it. So this is a very standard little bit of stats that goes on in finance. These are correlations between assets. So if you want to spread your portfolio, you don't want everything going up or down together, you want to spread your risk. So the number here, oh, can't reach that one there, shows that ATHX is perfectly correlated with itself, which of course it is. And if we pick something down here, we've got CFBK and PRGX have almost no correlation that when one goes up and the other one is completely unaffected or whether it goes down. Uh, so the numbers are fine, if, are good if you want to look at an individual case, and I've seen these kind of visualizations to try and put those into, into a picture. So, of course, you can see the perfect correlation diagonal where everything's correlated with itself. But then uh, what I did with these guys was I said, well, let's take the concepts that you get from biology and social networks, that you have, uh, you have relationships between things, if, um, that if you have uh, families of dolphins, you can see who's related to who, and they have groupings. And that's what's going on on the right here. I'm, depending on the threshold we set... I can start forming families of, of assets that move in similar directions. So this Bi, Bios, yes, BIOS and Andy, these uh, two up here, are highly correlated to each other, but they're actually part of a wider family that are all moving broadly together, and we've identified three different clusters here. Essentially, the, 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 the stuff that uh, the last speaker was doing on a much uh, larger scale is using those relationships in order to identify clusters and families that have something in common. Now, you might expect that they're all going to be, maybe these are oil, all oil industry things and they move with the price of oil and these are and then it's banking or whatever and move with interest rates, but maybe there's some other uh, thing to then investigate of why are these things in the same family if they don't share some obvious characteristic. And this is the, the biggest one. Um, the example here is kind of a, a silly illustration, but to me, this is the thing that, that I see most kind of blindness to, is um, when people measure a characteristic, they tend to look for the information that they measured. And they don't think what's hidden in here, what other things are hidden. I had a conversation with, uh, with uh, the guys who, um, the government department that does um, MOTs, saw point today, my car failed yesterday. Um, and he was, uh, had this database of all MOT uh, passes and failures uh, going back years. And for them, it was an operational thing. You know, are, are MOT test centers uh, doing tests and uh, are they signing the right paperwork? And, and he couldn't see that he had this asset that would tell you the reliability of every make of car. Right hidden in there would be how often, how long the brakes are going to last on a BMW 3 Series compared to a Volkswagen. All of that was hidden in the data. He had the Ford data that if, uh, if he just looked at it the right way, he could tell which test centers are the ones who go, ah, that's a fail, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to replace your brake pads and discs for, on that, when in fact they're making it up, because it would stand out in the data. And these are the kind of hidden signals. So here's my, here's my kind of 
my more silly example that I, uh, I did this as a little fun project. So here's a sound. So what's the hidden knowledge uh, embedded in that signal? It's a speeding ticket. The sound is the measured thing, but actually the hidden knowledge here is how fast is the vehicle going? And we can do that by actually just applying the same technique I did before, which is let's pick the frequencies out. And you can see the little Doppler shift frequency going on here where it goes down. And if we measure the little distance differences and add them all up and average, we end up with this curve for the change in frequency over the whole lot. Then off I run to Wikipedia and I get the formula for Doppler shift out. And now we're doing some mathematical modeling. So we take that curve that we've computed and we have to kind of uh, get the parameters out of this that will match and out pops this number here, the V 19.47 meters per second, about 40 miles an hour. So that's a speed ticket in a, in a town. And also interesting, you get out how close the observer was uh, to getting run over, 4.6 meters that, between the nearest point on the vehicle passing uh, and the, uh, the microphone. But this is, this is a general issue that there is always love, when you've got lots of dimensions, there is always things hidden in there if you just use your imagination. Um, I'll tell you another project that I did some work with. We, um, uh, we did a project for the NHS and they had some operational data. And this is a typical scenario. The operational data was collected only for operational reasons. They're logging, did the nurse give the medicine at the right time? Uh, you know, did they correctly log when uh, something, some event had happened? And then they would never looked at it again. They built this uh, database up in this uh, particular hospital for some years and had never gone back to it once it was marked, and any event was marked as done. And they didn't know what they were looking for. They just said, here's some data, tell us something interesting. And so we, uh, we plundered it for signals. And uh, from that, we managed to extract what are the things that cause people to slip, trip, and fall. That was the strongest signal we managed to discover. Um, that there are two things that predict whether you're going to fall over in hospital. One of them is not very useful, which is how sick you are. If people who are vomiting stay in bed so they don't fall over. So if you want to stop people falling over, you could make them sick, but that's kind of against the ethos of the NHS, I guess. And the other one we discovered was that it's not the number of nurses on the ward, it's the training level. That if the ratio between the uh, qualified nurses and the, the kind of um, helpers and locums and whatever the lower nursing tier is was uh, too low, then people fell over. So it was a supervision level issue that uh, popped out. But it was something that never occurred to them that they were looking for when they collected the data. So if my claim is true, why is it true? Why are we not doing, using all this great asset of computational knowledge out there? And um, I'm going to claim there's two basic reasons. Um, one is, it's difficult. Computation is complicated. And the other thing is, uh, is, a, is a much more fundamental human issue that you've got to know about these things to be able to use them. It's an educational problem. So I, unfortunately, I could talk for now about the second one because my, my evening job is a project to try and rewrite the maths curriculum, assuming computers exist, to try and address that question of how can we tell people more about the possibilities and spend less time learning how to do calculations by hand. Um, but let's talk about the first one that is difficult. So the answer to that is, of course, automation. That's the whole point about why we have computers, is to automate things. But the, the point I want you to think about, whether you're buying tools or whether you're making tools, is what can we automate? We want to automate not just the algorithm, which is where most people stop. They think, OK, I'm going to implement uh, uh, k-nearest neighbor machine learning method, and they implement the algorithm, and then they think they're done. Can we automate more of that process to make it so that people who don't understand the algorithm can use it? So let me show you uh, an example of that in practice. Let's uh, get a little bit of data here. So here's the manifest of the Titanic, just a classic machine learning example. Um, so these are the passengers. Uh, this person traveled first class. Um, they were 0.9 years old. So a <laughs> I was confused for a moment, a baby who is male, and they survived. So this is the outcome. I thought for a moment I'd got messed up my data. <laughs> I was expecting to see things like 29 there. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what we want to do is to do machine learning on that. And um, the task here, the task is classification. We have got classes of survived and died and possibly unknowns, and we want to predict the class. So what I'm going to do within our tool set is to say classify, and it was called tData. And it's going to have a little think about that. And it's going to produce this machine learning classifier. So the, what I think the most clever thing here is, is hidden in the small print of this thing. And it's probably too small for you to read at the back. It says here, uh, method logistic regression. I didn't say that. I said classify the data. 
there's maybe, I don't know, about seven or eight different machine learning algorithms built into this function. But the first job of the automation is to say, which one are we going to use? Now, I might be an expert. I might say, uh, I might have done this by hand and say, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to use uh, method goes to method goes to, I don't know, random forest. And then if I want to look up random forest, there's probably some hyperparameters underneath that. So I can't be bothered to do this now, but uh, somewhere down here in the details, there's four different sub things I could set for that. And if I'm an expert, I want to do those kinds of things. Um, actually, let's just do this random forest. And now you'll see I forced it into a particular method. But our attitude is, we're not done with the automation if there's more things that we could automate. So by automating the, um, the, the method, you now no longer need to know the pros and cons of the, of the different things. You, you might be an expert on machine learning, but do you know when to use each of the eight or 10 different ways of solving differential equations if you have a problem that's a modeling one, or, or half a dozen different ways of uh, optimizing functions if you're trying to find the best value of something? You can't be an expert on everything. So, as I say, whether you're buying or making tools, try and automate as much as possible uh, for your users. Let me just go back to automated here and get it back into logistic regression because I'm going to use this example a bit later. And even things like data types are, um, uh, are part of that automation. So I'm going to do some uh, classification of pictures here, little photographs in nighttime and daytime. But you can see that because the data types are automated as well. As the end user is the thing we're trying to expose, completely hides that. And all I have to do is exactly the same as I had before, which is input and output. And it doesn't matter that the first one was uh, string, real, string, and this time it's images. That should all be part of the automation. Um, and so here's my classifier, which uh, this time it's uh, used logistic regression. Uh, and it's done a not bad job. It's got number th two wrong. So it thinks that's nighttime, but it's got the other, the other five right. Right, let's skip the next example. So in the end, one of the, what, the ultimate goal, and we shouldn't forget, the ultimate goal is insights. That's why we're doing data science. We want to learn something uh, from, from the data. And so what we want to do is to try and move more towards the idea of can we automate all the way to automating insights. Now, that's really, for me, where big data comes in. Because when you actually start providing more data, then you can pick out more subtle signals. And you can, uh, you can use a greater variety of inputs, which may you know, unexpectedly be the signal that allows you to make, uh, provide the insights. And so um, by the time you've added a decent amount of data, you can start doing kind of useful things that are beyond um, um, something that you might plan for. Um, so let's turn on the camera here. And I have uh, a plan ahead, a person. That's a good start. So I've been going around uh, the coffee break looking for things that wine. OK. <laughs> I've been caught out there. <laughs> uh, see else, what, what else I picked up at, uh, at the break. Red Delicious, that's pretty good. And these are on the tables everywhere. But this one's kind of um, pineapple. Well, it could be a pineapple hiding in there, if you think about it. Who's to say what's below the surface? Or uh, we can do things like uh, extract different signals from the data. So if I give it a moment, here it spots that I'm a male. And now let's, uh, this is the risky one. See what it has to say. Oh, that's unkind. <laughs> Oh, that's better. It's such close. We've got within two years from home there, but it's, uh, it's the harsh lighting. I'm not, I haven't aged uh, a lot today. <laughs> oh, it's perfect for a moment. I'll stop there at, uh, at 47, which is the, the true answer. Now, what we need to move towards is, is embracing that. That was all uh, supervised learning where um, cases were given uh, in advance. But all of these techniques, what we need to move towards is the idea of unsupervised and just having things where the computer says to you, here's something interesting. And you can say, well, no, it's not, or it is, rather than you having to say, I think it might be interesting to look at this. So of course, uh, you know, the good example of that is, uh, is un uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I've got time. This is a cool example. Let me do this one. Um, and actually, it's a useful example of injecting context. I'm going to teach it rock, paper, scissors. And hopefully, if this works, we'll do this in a few seconds. So I'm going to give it 10 images of a rock, Get ready with paper. Click on paper. There's paper images. I can't see what I'm doing. Well, we've got about 10 of them. Oh, the lighting's changing. I don't want that. Let's go to scissors. And once we've got enough of those, we'll hit stop. And we'll do a training for a few seconds. Whoops, I accidentally exposed the code here. But while it's thinking, I'll show you that uh, you can see that the, um, the code, the machine learning here is exactly the same thing. It's just, not, it's just the rest is all interface code to capture the camera. So hopefully, what I have here is now, if I go to watch mode, here's the moment of truth. Let's do a rock, paper. Scissors? OK. Oh, 
papers that way. Yep, I think we're getting pretty good response there. Oh, that was wrong. Come on, sis. Thank you. <laughs> so it's just a case of supervised learning. But actually, hidden behind the automation there is, uh, is another one. That's not a good picture <laughs> of injecting computation. Because the reason why I can do that in 30 images, sorry, injecting context, is that before I started, the classifier that I was using was pre-trained on 150, 200,000 image net images. So it already knew what kind of features to look for in an image. So we can inject that knowledge of the world as a whole, of pineapples and apples and the like. And it's learned from that that pointiness and pink patches and corners, whatever these things are it's decided are important, are what it's going to look for. Now, if I'd given it 150,000 images of rock, paper, scissors, it would forget all of that and say all that matters is fingers and uh, knuckles and, and other features. But by injecting the knowledge that's acquired from other contexts into this uh, space, we can make something that actually works in, in such a tiny amount of data. So back to the point I was trying to make, which was about supervising hands-off, is we need to start having systems present things to us and doing automated things in the hope that they might be useful. And a you know, classic example of that is unsupervised learning. So here's a, a database I pulled from the Stanford Dogs database. These are 60-odd images of four different breeds of dog, and I forgot what it was, poodles, basset hounds, and a couple of others, um, uh, Irish wolfhound, and then there's some kind of other dog in here. Um, so, but I'm not going to tell it, I'm not going to give it labels here, I'm just going to say uh, images. So let's hide that. And uh, what I'm going to do, ordinarily you would uh, look for a feature vector of that's maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 uh, long, but I'm going to squash it down to a feature vector of two here so I can lay it out on the page. And what it's done here is it's put, grouped things by features that it's found that appear to be in common. So it has, still has no idea that they're dogs or breeds of dogs. But you can see already insight is emerging that we have uh, down at the bottom here all the Basset Town. Oh, it's covered up. I thought it's the Basset Town's bottom, I think. Um, but yes, these appear to all be the hounds. Over here, we've got the poodles. And it's found subclasses within the poodles, given that they're all poodles. There's uh, pale, puffy poodles and dark poodles. And the wolfhounds up here. And it's got a couple here where it's, it can't decide. They're sort of in between wolfhound and that other dog that I don't know what I selected. Um, so, you know. Dogs aren't terribly useful, but if you're in the context of cells from the human body, forming clusters may be useful. It's up to the doctors to come along and say, you know what, those are cancer cells, but maybe they're not. Maybe there are other subclasses of cells that are in these slides, and uh, by having automation suggestings for humans rather than the other way around, then we can, uh, we can move forward. And actually, let's just do one more thing here, which is to, just to test that, uh, that feature extraction here by taking some unseen dogs and... So at the top, so I grew it. tests are at the top, so these are the unseen dogs, and these are the dogs it decides in that feature space are the nearest to the, um, to the dog at the top. So this is the nearest in the database of 60 that I gave it to this image here, and you can see it's done a pretty good job. This one's a bit of an odd choice with a big little white body. And this one seems to have uh, matched backgrounds as much as it has foregrounds. It seems to both be having something similar going on in the background. Right, um, let me now step away from uh, the computation and the data for a moment and try and make a point about uh, the end of automation because automation doesn't just stop at the, the computational data science-y bit because it's very easy to accept one's role in life. You're a data scientist, your job is to do data science, and then you hand it to somebody else who uh, says, okay, I'm going to make an app out of this and sell it. I'm going to plumb it into the corporate system and uh, make it part of the production environment. And developers come in there. And our view is that automation should go all the way through the process, not just uh, stop with the, the maths. So things like, uh, at sort of ultimate level of automation, I'm just going to make a little interface here. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say, um, what am I going to say? I'm going to say uh, interactive plot of uh, sine fx. Probably the easiest thing I can do in one sentence. And what we're trying to do here is linguistically match that to a program that I could have written. The program itself has a certain amount of automation to try and figure out what's the appropriate controller to make this little interface that I can now, um, uh, I can now play around with and see the effect of the frequency on, on sine of f of x. And I can accept that and say, yeah, that's the kind of code we wanted. But even within the code, we're trying to avoid things like on-action events and, uh, and having to do a layout panel and say this is going to be an image. And uh, when the computation returns, write the image to the screen, all of that programmer stuff should be automatable away, in, at least in simple cases. Um, of course, there's, um, there's um, 
no getting away from in more complicated cases. Here's uh, the largest piece of code I'm going to show you today. Uh, so this is a little app to do some data science. This is the current state of the borrow a bike system in London. So if you are planning to uh, ride back to the station right now, high number of bikes. Uh, where are we? We're over here, aren't we? So there are some uh, couple of stands here with lots of bikes still to take. Uh, but if you run this as animation, you find they'll rush outwards at the end of uh, the day and rush in, in the mornings. But what I'm doing here is pulling some data and injecting the kind of context I showed right at the beginning of this talk. But for anyone who knows the, uh, the Wolfram language, uh, I have four here. Is that okay? Um, Okay, uh, so let me ex get the explanation of why, it, how this works. You can ask me that as a question if you want. One of the things we want to make it possible is for you to be able to take your work and not just do it and make it into apps, but do things like deployment. So I can take that uh, piece of code, shove it uh, into a cloud environment, and if you are quick to type, you can type this URL down and, uh, and play with this application right now, if it's still uh, initializing. So here it is now running out of a web browser. So in the space of 10 lines of code, I've made an app, pushed it to the cloud, and in fact, this app goes a bit further than London. I can pick from one of uh, 100 odd cities around the world. Uh, we ought to pick somewhere big enough that they might actually have bikes. Copenhagen, they bound to have bikes in Copenhagen. Um, they all have bikes, but some of these, if you pick the city, there's like two bike stands. If you can ride between one and the other. Okay, so the API is actually re returning zeros, which is not very useful, but at least you can see where they are. <laughs> So let me wrap so we do have a moment for questions. So uh, my, my meta message here is the tool set is huge. Do not be locked into a mono paradigm way of thinking. You're not just a statistician or even just a machine learning expert. They're all there to be used. And if you have, if, if you have the uh, sufficient automation in the tools you can use, they're available to you with only uh, a certain sort of basic level of, um, of technical education without having to be an expert if you trust a level of the automation and uh, try and focus your role on trying to think of the interesting questions or interpreting the results, not spending your time implementing algorithms and, uh, and patching together tools. Thank you very much. I'll just have my glass of wine while I take a question. Anyone? Okay, well, thank you very much.